All right, good morning, everyone, or good evening. My name is Kevin Pro, and I'm from the Apogee Product Marketing Team. Uh, welcome to our live AMA. Today, we are uh, joined by Neil Erickson, Vice President of Digital Platforms at Equifax. Uh, he will be sharing his experience on how he supported 2.5 billion API transactions uh, using a combination of microservices and uh, Apogee. Uh, welcome, Neil. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Sure. All right. So um, Equifax, you may know the, the name and the, the company, but, you know, in essence, it's a, uh, a institution that's been around for a long time, uh, established in 1899. So it has a rich history of of gr mar market growth and, and finding uh, needs within the market that that need to be fulfilled for establishing trust between entities. And um, we've grown through the years through merger acquisition, um, you know, finding new opportunities and uh, either acquiring or building new sets of, of data capabilities. Um, and with all that through the years, there, there was a, a big, um, you know, set of complexities that came up around many data centers, many systems built throughout the, the years that with different sort of generations of technology, uh, compatibility, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and so we sort of set off to uh, do a transformation to simplify our, our technology stack and, and get to a place where uh, the various use cases that we provide for uh, services for uh, throughout the market are, are done in a more simplistic manner and a more manageable sort of uh, set of things across the globe. Next slide. Uh, so if you if you think about what we do as a company, we, we've got um, a lot of uh, data capabilities uh, for various insights throughout the market. Uh, we run a very highly secure um, regulatory sort of bound uh, set of systems um, that um, you know come with a, a, a lot of complexity onto themselves. Uh, but on top of that, we've got the, the uh, various services and compute that would process that data, um, you know, organize it, uh, create further insights on top of it, and, and serve it up to the market. Uh, so, so with this sort of uh, horn diagram we got here, uh, you, you know, you can see the ingest uh, side of the house, which has a number of of of. Uh, boundary-based things that we do with a number of data providers throughout the uh, industries. And then on the other side, you, you see how we serve our customers and, you know, whether it be a consumer or a business or a government entity, and then everything in between. Those are all different systems that needed to be transformed uh, to modern-day set of microservices. Uh, they might have been um, monolith sort of systems uh, behind the scenes but as we as we've got gotten to the cloud you know established patterns with on uh, gcp or mi microservice computing uh talking with our data fabric and then ultimately you know, having the api interfaces for for the various uh contributors and consumers of the service next slide um, you know, our, our goals were, as I mentioned, it was a very complex environment, many data centers, many monoliths, generations of technology, you, you name a technology and an acronym, we had it. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, really, we wanted to reduce that complexity. Um, and then I think, um, you know, modern cloud computing, the, the, the power of having uh, security built in from, from the ground up rather than an afterthought. Um, so the, the zero trust uh, policies that sort of come with with doing business in the cloud, um, the ability to scale um, and you know do that have that agility and ability to innovate with customers because we're building things um, a little bit uh, less coupled and more discrete function, and then of course the resiliency of being able to scale as or, or be able to run. Um, active active you know in a more reliable manner in 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 the regions that we that we serve next slide so um thus far you know what have we done thus far we have a massive amount of data so um data flowing in and and through the the fabric 
um, you know, petabytes of data. We've, we've got tons of uh, contributors that have been migrated. So if you think of all those data points coming into that ecosystem, uh, where the data comes from, there's over a million different contributors have been migrated uh, you know, to the new services and new uh, con contribution capabilities. Um, we've got applications not, you know, I'm sure this number is bigger than what was stated here at this point. Uh, over 900 applications have been rebuilt from those monoliths on into the cloud. And then, as as the title of this session uh, alluded to, we've got um, you know multiple billion transactions happening on a monthly basis um, that are API transactions, and those are both supporting customer requests, but also internal you know systems that that are you know within the dependency tree of a of a given solution. And then um, you know thousands of, of B2B customers migrated as well. So lots of lots of momentum, and there's been a big effort to get us to this point. Next slide. So again, if you, if you think about some of the things, uh, so everybody talks about microservices. We, at, at the center of our uh, transformation is really our microservice patterns. So, um, if looking at some of those systems of the past that had high, highly coupled, um, big big domains of function that were sort of muddled together, uh, it was really important for us to break that up for a number of reasons, technically, but also um, to sort of break down some of the the uh, walls that were put up in uh, artificially internally. So breaking down the the um, you know, tribalism, I would say, of, of different platforms that we had in the past and getting to a place where, you know, services are, were more um, discreet and easier to manage and easier for others to contribute to. So sort of open sourcing our, our own systems internally so we can do work across the teams that had been there. Um, so we breaking up the monolith was, was key. And then to establish key platform capabilities. Um, some of those systems of the past, I mean, you had to do a, a whole release, you know, in order to release something small. Um, we really wanted to get to a place where we can um, release products in a more nimble way or change a feature out with a service that doesn't then require every single part of that, that overall solution stack to change. Um, microservices of, you know, gave us that ability. Um, and then uh, you know, really think about the channel services that we provide, um, you know, so creating um, systems from, you know, our e-commerce system that, that are built for not everything is needed in every region or for every solution. So can we deploy independently in a way that is cost effective to each region and the business that's happening there? So, next slide. Um, so our API approach, um, we had, a, you know, early on, we we sort of looked at our transformation as data, you know, cloud compute, and quickly became like, well, API's got to be a key component of it. They have to be at, at every level of our solution. Um, and, you know, so we very much wanted to transform our, our key things that we do, the key products, and make uh, good versions of the API products that should be in market for those key services. So that was one. But then a, a second, like our, our, we had tons of customer integration. So if you think about those, those million plus contributors, uh, data contributors that were out there, uh, you think about all the institutions in, in, the, in the world that are larger institutions that rely on, on certain data and decisions, some of those, their own systems are really old. Um, yeah, and they don't want to touch them. <laughs> so the transformation uh, time frame takes a while. You have to move at their pace. So, so using APIs as a method, a method for one strangling our our own legacy systems, but also building out the you know t time capsule integrations in a way that you can do that and do it in a friendly way that doesn't have to be out in the public, but you know still allowing that customer to interact and we're facading out. Um, to the newer things where we're needed. And in some cases, we're facading to the older things we're needed. So we, 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 we use APIs as a, as a method very much to 
throttle and you know have a hammer and carrot approach to transformation with our with our customers and our and our uh, contributors in a way we don't we want to minimize impact to the overall ecosystem um, and then marketplace integration so how do we you know this is sort of I'd say a little further out on the on our you know or newer in our transformation cycle um, how do we when we do publish out a product how do we use the api's and integrations to have a have a larger um, distribution network for products and and really create other channels of distribution uh, through the use of, of apis so, um, next slide all right so so how did we start um, well as with everything I, I think we had a, a good um, technology initiative um, that was you know let's let's get Apogee installed and let's start doing these things and it, and it was it took off really fast um, and fast to the point where we needed to almost slow it down a little bit to get control of their, what does this mean to our company so we had to um, go up to our SLT level get the buy-in from the SLT level to the 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 department leads each of the divisional presidents um, and across to go this is a program we're going to launch and this is what it's going to mean to you and your and your staff um, from how you create, think about products to how you um, you you think about the the development of things, and ultimately this should be a first first class thing. We actually named the program API First, and it was a a program we launched um, globally. And then with that program came, well, we need to get a COE in place and start establishing the the base patterns. Uh, we need to help people understand what good is and make sure they're doing that as part of their project life cycle. Um, and so it was a little bit of a, a central governance model at first. Um, and you know, as I mentioned, patterns. So looking at things and saying not every API is the same. There are patterns in proper ways of using it, using the a API management platform. Um, and then how, how we should utilize the not just the Apogee, but the dev portal for certain patterns of, of function. And then governance and adoption. So I think um, at this point, you know, we, we've been down the road a bit. We're actually changing that central model that I mentioned uh, as the COE to be more about community of practice and federated governance um, across the org. So not being, you know, removing some of those obstacles that might have slowed down pace and productivity. Um, to make sure we can get the speed that we need, but still have the visibility and consistency across the board. And that means each part of the org that we're allowing to do that has matured to a point that if, if they can do that, they have the right roles in place, they have the right knowledge in place. But the ones that don't, we are still sort of, you know, doing doing at the pace that they can. Um, next slide. So, you know, we, we talk about one, one thing that sort of came up along the way was, well, hey, I'm building my microservices. That's good, right? That's good enough. I don't need to use Apogee. Um, and then we've got like our, our other camps that are going, well, we're creating our APIs. That's good. Um, but the reality is this all, this all needs to exist together. Um, and when you do this together, if you're not putting the right things in place, you get more complexity than you really need. Um, so our viewpoint was to look at it and go, where should what pattern should we be putting in place to to one um, maximize the the use and visibility of the API management tools, and and how do we still get the the speed and agility of what microservices can do when they're interacting with them each other within a within a region or a zone. So our internal apps, if we have we have many VPCs across the each region and across the globe. If you've got an app running within a particular VPC, how do you establish the 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 way that Apogee is going to be able to see what's happening, um, but the traffic doesn't need to jump jump out and go out to the, the SaaS platform of Apogee. Uh, we, we've, you know, use Anthos, um, the, the, the uh, Envoy Aware, or Apogee Aware Envoy proxies uh, to, to help us there. And as well as on the client transactions. So we, we got not 
some client transactions go directly to the um, to the API uh, URI that, that's provided. And then we have certain use cases that we look at where we might want to minimize the latency down even further. And that's where we go directly to those Envoy uh, proxies that are Apigee aware. Um, so we can still get the visibility, still have the consistency of pattern, um, but getting the benefits of, of maybe uh, removing a hop um, and streamlining a transaction. Um, next slide, thank you. Um, so on this slide, um, if it goes here, uh, you'll see the, you might have to click it again, camera. There we go, maybe. Yeah, so so this slide you'll see um, our dev portal. So at the heart of everything for us was really around the experience. So we, we're managing a lot of change, both internally for our developers internally, um, but also for our customers um, and the contributors. Uh, some of these institutions are not very tech savvy and some are very savvy. Um, so our dev portal became a mechanism to help um, manage that experience, uh, in some cases, to really streamline the, the email that goes out to somebody that's not, hasn't really looked at this stuff yet and isn't really ready to go, here are the five steps you need to do to get onto the new API. Uh, so, and now they're, the good thing about that is now they're using OAuth and now they're using, uh, you know, they're in a controllable environment that we can start nudging them through changes over time. Um, versus here's this brand new product API that we've got that we're feeling really, really savvy about. And we can start marketing to, to companies and pushing, pushing them to the particular page to learn more and seeing how those more savvy, technology savvy uh, potential customers convert in a channel. So we, we've got everything going on through this dev portal. And one of the features that we've built into this, it, it, it talks to Apigee through the, the Drupal modules provided, but then we built some layers of abstraction on top of that to handle some of the things that we do as a company to make sure the right people are, are util, utilizing the APIs. Uh, we have uh, very much running, very the notion of security, compliance, uh, who, only certain people are allowed to hit certain uh, types of APIs and data. There's permissible purpose for, for certain APIs that we have to maintain. And if we weren't talking about API management, you were talking about data access, it would be exactly the same. There, there's, what is this person intending to do? Are they reputable? Can, can, should we allow it? And do we have the access to shut them, or do we have the capability to, to and controls to shut that down when needed? Um, our dev portal allows for that, and uh, when the entity comes in, they're able to set up an application. Uh, the notion of their company, the, their team, they can invite other team members to that application development. They can then, from that app, in that notion of an application, they can then uh, subscribe to certain APIs and go through a sandbox to test to prod uh, and step through the environments and, and manage their endpoints and their and their uh, certs in one location. Um, and um, another important bit is, I, I'd say on this, we've uh, our learnings were, you know, from a feature function perspective, it, it's great if you're just to get a good dev portal up and running is is important. That you start managing it from a usability perspective, taking some of those common things that you would do with a website and looking at the behavior and going, are are we losing? people on certain steps. Do we need to change the functionality to make things more findable or usable or understandable? Um, and, and really start applying that rigor to, to this. So user experience becomes key. Um, and we have, we have a, a lot, I, I would say we've done a gr great job getting to where we are, but we also have learned a lot and are, are planning to do a lot more in this space. Um, I think this, our dev portal itself will become sort of beyond APIs, it will be how we help customers get from some of the more traditional ways that they've been working with us, which is files, file transfers, and, and things of that nature, and get them into the world of streaming and get them into the world of, of RESTful uh, interactions. And, and that's gonna be something that we we look to do over the, ne the next quarter, a number of quarters is, is uh, get some functionality out that really 
uh, helps our customers advance their world and and ultimately creates our makes our products a little bit a little bit better over time too. Next slide. All right. So what did we learn? Um, I would say, uh, you know, this this sometimes is a, a no brainer, but in a lot of times with engineers, we we leverage others for what they do better than you. <laughs> do what you have to do to to make a, a differentiated product. Um, so that leverage the cloud for scale. So I mean, it's there. The premise is there for for being able to scale easier. Our use of Apigee X or Apigee, sorry, it, it, in uh, a SaaS environment has allowed us to scale a lot easier than if we were managing it all ourselves. We have a lot of other things that we need to scale. Um, you know, this, you know, the way we've implemented Apigee Edge and now Apigee X allows us to, um, you know, spend a little less time worrying about the ramp up of um, a certain percentage of traffic over a, a month period. It, we, we do pay attention, but it's not um, something that we have a whole bunch of people running around doing. Uh, prioritize customer experiences, as I mentioned in the last slide. Thinking about the API from an experience perspective, not just the, the UI, but also the API itself. So we've learned from customers that use mul multiple APIs from us that we actually weren't doing a good job of making them consistent. Um, having similar objects be completely different in those APIs caused friction for the customer. Um, having uh, certain use cases uh, uh, covered that for some of these older systems that would help them get on board, all that stuff leads to uh, a better experience for our customers and for the those that rely on our services. Uh, operational simplicity, so um, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think thinking about the world of microservices and APIs, it, if you're doing a lot, it gets complex quick if you're not careful. So how do you get the single view, um, the single point of a uh, single pane of, of, of what's happening in this world? How do you how do you do things consistently? Um, and I, I actually see this as a API management becomes less of a a thing you do over here, it becomes more of a thing you do holistically within the within the overall cloud stack. Um, and then acknowledge that it's a journey. So this, I, you know, in a decent size size organization, every part's going to have their own step and their own maturity. You're going to have things like attrition. Uh, we've all been experiences experienced over the past number of years um, with. The changes in the org, each part is going to have different skill levels, different understanding, different process maturity, and being flexible to go, here's how we want to navigate through, and, and assessing that as a program team to go, the next step of maturity for this part of the org is if we got them the right training, or we need to change this tooling around so they have the ability, or it's, you, you know, they, they're able to do this self-aware of it. So I, th I think um, that the journey bit is you got to be flexible, you got to be patient, but push, drive, um, and and uh, um, evangelize. You can't do enough communications. With that, I think uh, that was the last slide, right, Karen? That's right. All right. Um, well, thank you so much, Neil. Um, we're also joined here by, uh, with uh, Gira Sujef uh, from our PM team. Uh, and we have we have some great questions that have come from the audience. Um, here are a few questions. Um, how did you define the boundary for your microservices? Did you use any tiny database for each microservice? What service discovery tools have you used for microservices? Um, so we have we have um, within our org we have various divisions of uh, business and within those divisions there are some uh, uh, particular platforms or services that had been there historically so that helped us give us a a, a set of boundaries that we wanted to create in um, and some of that is we we wanted it at, and others that like we're kind of forced into a way just how our business is shaped based off of our our geographic footprints and what we do in certain regions and what we can't do in other regions. So 
So that sort of helped define where a service is going or how many uh, regions or how many VPCs that we're in, uh, so on. I would say within that those given bounds, you have certain uh, contracts being stood up uh, that interact with, let's say, a certain data exchange. So you're going to have uh, the, the, the resources that you're going towards already sort of established there. You're going to build a co the compute around it to do the um, do the level of service that you need. And I would say that's where the interesting questions start coming in. So when you have a microservice that then has to talk with something outside of that domain or outside of that VPC, how do you want to manage that? Um, and that's for to us. Anytime we did an outbound um, uh, crossing of a line, that's where we started to establish. Well, here's here's the API that we want to put in place. Whether it's an API proxy that everybody goes through, that's that's you know going through Apogee in a way, right? Or if it's a um, Envoy uh, Apogee aware proxy. Like those are the decisions we need to make and sit down and and decide those things. There's there's slight trade offs there. Um, how do we do discovery? Well, we've got multiple tools that we use for that. Um, I don't want to rattle off tools, but we we have we have a number of things we do at the security layer to know all the endpoints and everything that's happening. We we also have a number of things that we we utilize uh, from a uh, just. We, we're, we've got a multi-vendor approach, put it that way, if that helps. I think I answered all those questions. Yeah. So there are uh, multiple questions and one there, so that was a tricky one. Gear, is, is there anything you want to add? No, I mean, I, I, no, I think uh, Neil's answer is great. I mean, it really comes down to how you're going to decide to draw those lines and make those barriers. Um, uh, I mean, I, I can give a technical answer up, about what that looks like, but uh, I think the more interesting answer is the one that we quick got uh, from context with Neil. Great. Okay. Uh, next question are, what are the recommended security requirements for Apogee operations during setup uh, and the security and observ observability of APIs when migrating to uh, microservices from legacy COTS and mainframes? Hmm. Okay. So I'm trying to unpack that question. So, so for the secure, are, we have, let me put it this way. We have a security posture that's defined by each, but globally one, we have a global security organization. Then we have a, we have regional BISOs or, or division level uh, BISOs and security officers that define further policy. Apogee allows us to apply policies in a consistent manner. Um, as they come onto the platform, we are able to create, we have the global policies and, and the regional policies that we apply uh, for the various things that we need to do, whether it's um, whether it's a, a you know a, a, to a token based sort of thing, or if it's hey we just want to encrypt everything, or, or we want to mask certain data because it's going between here and there. Uh, there's a number of different things that we we apply, and we do that at, as part of that uh, proxy flow that's defined. Um, and that what Apogee allows us to do is do that, simplify that complexity a little bit and have that be the, the mechanism. So, um, and then as part of, from design time through to production, we have a number of checkpoints. And so in the designs, are we thinking about the right thing, security? Do we have the right uh, pattern in place? Um, you know, we, we get it into a solution review where we get a little bit more in the weeds about um, the architecture and how it's gonna be used and do are we doing the right things? And then we have, testing, you know, that gets built and we have the testing and security validation and checks and so on and so forth that we go through on our path to production. So it, it's thought from point A all the way to we're now in production. There's there's a number of checks that we do to make sure the right policies are used and, um, and that we don't have a thousand of them. They're consistent. We've got patterns and what they are. So it, it becomes clear, you know, how things how things should be. I think I answered the question there. Yeah. Um, on that, uh, can you share any uh, API uh, security best practices? Um, 
Um, I, I think I kind of just did if I if I were to re re explain that answer in a different way. So your COE should be have an aspect of that. Your your security team should have a seat at the table during the API lifecycle. Um, and that's from a design time to production. Like you, you need to think about how you apply the security and check and validate what what's going out into them to production and publicly facing or even internally facing has the right security layer. We have a OAuth de facto. Like there's no there's no you know is it taking the zero trust uh, cloud policies and doing that all the way through. So for us that that was really easy. We've got the handbook. We 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 pull that out and you're not creating and deploying anything that doesn't meet the meet the standards there. Uh, from a outside of the traditional uh, API program perspective, how do we think about security and particularly API security is an app. We, we have work work groups and, and sessions with people that aren't within our organization that are all, their whole job is just security and they, they maintain the posture and the, the, the policies and standards and we work with them to change them for the better over time as API technology advances. Hope I answered that. Great, thanks. Um, there were some other questions about about security, but I think you've I think you've covered them already. Um, let's let's, ask some, <laughs> let's uh, hopefully let's uh, let's let's look at some of the questions that are bringing together um, service mesh and and Apache together. So, one question from the audience is: Does does Anthos service mesh simplify or complicate the role of uh, Apache for API management? Uh, I think if you if you went back a year, maybe a little bit, you know, as the service meshes came out, it for sure complicated things because they were they almost were two different things that did similar things, and there was overlap, and there was confusion as to why one versus the other, or do I use it together? Um, and that's where I think n where we are now, and I think through some of the things we lived through in the past couple of years have gotten us to a place where we see the complement in the union as being the the, the positive. Um, what I mean by that is I think the, the re we talked a little bit on a podcast recently about reputation and the reputation of API versus the reputation of microservice. And it was like, yeah, I'm creating my microservices. I don't really need to use the Apache stuff. And and I'm, I'm great doing this. I'm grinding this out. Well, the reality is you're creating multiple viewpoints, multiple things to manage in an inconsistent way, which creates complexity. So if you bring those together and say, here's how I handle exit points, and here's how I handle those border points a little bit in a consistent way, um, using the Apogee aware proxies that, that the service mesh allows for, then you get that consistent view of how things are consumed, how things are behaving and at all levels. So if you, we had some good examples of the, a great API being created, a whole bunch of microservices being created, and they might've done a few uh, Envoy aware, but they didn't have all the resource bound things done properly. And they came back and said, well, how, how do I build for this? I can't build for it. I can't get the visibility I need. I have to go way down in the, the belly of the system in order to turn, like, well, just, you, you need to create the APIs, and, and then we can have that that visibility as how things are going and how it's behaving together, and get the behavioral analytics across it to to really do the right thing. So I think it it naturally it, every solution isn't the same too. That's my my caveat to this whole thing. You you're within the the scope of your solution. You're going to determine what works for you and what's the right thing to do um, for the problems you're trying to solve. Gear, is, is there anything you want to add on that? Yeah, a little bit. I'll say that um, that with uh, with service mesh, 
in general and, and, and API management in general, there's some definite overlap. And uh, and I, I think at the beginning, I agree, uh, it's part of what Neil said, that, that when, when these originally started coming out, or, or notably with service mesh started to become popular, people were like, great, we don't need to worry about API management anymore. But they're not really solving exactly the complete set of uh, problems in the same yeah. way. Right, so so you still, if you still need to care about developer engagement and uh, self providing self service access for developers to create their own tokens and 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 and, and uh, get access to APIs and learn about those APIs, that's absolutely the wheel space of of API management and not the space of of mesh, right? But uh, if, if that you don't care, right? So if you if you legitimately have internal only APIs for your self run program. And you don't want and never will want to throttle and keep track of those. And the developer uh, that's that's creating this service is also the same developer that's going to consume it when they build the next next microservice. Maybe you don't need API management for that, and maybe Service Mesh solves that all by itself and does everything you need. But if you as soon as you're gonna you start to think of that world that you have as having boundaries, as having a technical or business domain boundary, and you want to make those services generally available to any other consumer on the other side of that boundary. Now you've created something that, to me, looks a whole lot like an API management problem. And then managing the developer engagement lifecycle is something that you're going to have to do, and that's what API management does. And so, but, but so Apogee with the with the Envoy adapter makes it possible to kind of bridge that gap, and we do that by directly um, adding uh, API management inside that mesh piece, so that we don't have to add a whole new gateway for it. So I I, I don't think it complicates it. I think it's definitely a one plus one equals three. You get a lot more out of adding both of them, but you definitely need to decide: Do I need it for this use case or not? See this 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 is why Gears on the phone, and he just explains it so perfectly. That's that was well bro broken down. I love it. All Thanks. right, um, great. So um, on that, one of the questions uh, that kind of connects into this is costs. So how do you justify costs um, for the simplicity that's introduced and the complexity that's reduced? Oof. Well, I mean, I think. Cost is a major factor uh, when you look at resources taken to manage something, um, and not just manage something okay to get visibility across things. Um, it takes overhead, and so the overhead, if you're able to reduce the the work that's taken to do that, um, then that's great. Um, I think, from a time perspective, um, time to react. Um, and be aware of, of something that's going on. That awareness factor be, be, between the two two realms, I think, is another bit. Um, depends on the scope of things that you're you're building. Like if you're building think something that's not quite mission critical, well, yeah, you don't you you, you got a different threshold than something that's like running, um, you know, a a you know. A, international set of businesses. I mean, there, there's just different scopes. Um, so you have to look at the look at that. And I'd say, I, I, was the question, how do you measure? Um, um, it's, it's here in the chat from uh, Lakhiv Singh. Uh, how, how did you justify costs as per the simplicity introduced and complexity reduced? Yeah, so in justify, it was, it was part of an overall large Global transformation project. So you you look at at a holistic and go, we're going to have all of this stuff being built and all this stuff being built, and we know there's chaos and we know there, there's there's um, um, a whole bunch of people running in a direction. Um, how do we establish use this as a mechanism in the middle uh, to to help smooth that out of it? And then ultimately, too, with our operations folks that deal with customers, we're getting direct feedback as to what they're feeling and how they're how smooth they're going through and so if it becomes pain enough we're able to invest more in the in the things that we need to do because we're hearing about it as any good feedback loop does and so it, it wasn't like hey let's just throw everything at it it's it's we think we need this and then reacting based off of um, market signals as well as uh, internal just Looking at the books, going like we have way more people spending time helping out with this sort of effort. Right. effort so here's how we're going to do it. That's it, it. It sounds kind of like like deploy once and like create once, but deploy many times, right? Yeah, it's a good ROI question. 
Yeah, and I, and I think we're always going to be looking at it. It doesn't die. Um, it doesn't once you once you put it out there, you don't just forget about it. It's like right now we're making looks at looking at it, going like, here's what the market's doing. Here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to expand. Here's the 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 further investment we're going to put towards this area. Um, and we'll be doing that at every cycle, every every mm -hmm. quarter, every budget cycle. We're we're looking at where, how do we improve, and is that improvement worth the the money we we would spend on? Peter, any, anything you want to add? I guess I would say so. So I live in Sweden. It's cold here. There's a lot of snow <laughs> and ice in the winter. Um, and I would say, how far and how fast are you willing to drive on the road without snow tires? Um, so you, there's, there's a cost for this, but things sure do get a lot easier, a lot more controllable once you make that investment and everyone wins for it. It's not just that you don't crash your car. It's that the other people driving on the road also can see you and trust that you're going to be in your lane, if you will, um, literally, um, in that way. And so I think that the, the cost of this investment also bears out in terms of how other people are going to use what you're doing it's not just a matter of, how, of the speed to innovation for in your own right for what you're building it's also the speed of adoption uh that that's going to drive even more um, innovation later based on that same uh, on the same investment and if you really want to go fast gear you get a snowmobile and a plow <laughs> <laughs> all right um another question can, can you explain the future scope of restful web services Maybe your point of view on using RESTful web services. Yeah, um, I view, you know, so where I, I can explain it to from where we are. <clears throat> we have a very much a. We've been dealing with traditional things, so we've got a system. You want to send us data, look query data. You want to update something. Um, you know, sort of the basics. Uh, I, I I would say where we're looking into the future is how do we bind the things that were non-traditional that we do? Like, you, you know, we've got tons, of, as I mentioned, the industry runs on file, file movement, moving of files around. Like, how do we move? And then we've got, we know we have technologies out there in the streaming space. So how do we do more? in the restful space to nudge people into the right direction away from the things they used to do and making the APIs um, more usable and more carrots, I, I would say, in the industry that get people off of the things that they're doing in these large institutions. So I I view it as like, I, 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 and I don't think I'm answering the question directly, but I, it's to me, the evolution of restful services goes like, we're gonna, you know the newer protocols that are that are coming out um so you got http2 http3 how does how does that enhance what you can do with restful services and all that gear can probably will give you a way better answer than that well i no i don't know uh, th i would say there's rest is a standard it's it's a more or less static standard and it's been with us for a long time i don't think it's i, I don't know that there's a lot of yeah. changes uh, worth worth discussing there there are as you said new protocols part of those are the the transport protocol by http right uh, different versions two now being uh, uh standard three being talked about and it's really to, to push for adoption there but things like grpc which takes mm -hmm. us away from rest we've got a verb and entity driven system to one that looks decidedly more like so right uh, which is something that the rest restful world speaks against uh let's be honest right that yeah we, the rest, rest, rest was a triumph over soap, and gRPC aims to say, well, actually, there were some good things about that. We might want to go back there. And versus GraphQL, which it wants to make the whole world think of everything we do with APIs look a whole lot like a, a database query, right? I, I, and all of these, I don't know that any of these are going to become triumphant over REST because REST is really, really good at what it does, but they do offer a, a unique way of solving other types of problems. And I'll give a specific example, right? So I something that I've always railed against uh, when, when talking to customers and, and doing consulting with them, is this idea of building back end for front ends. I, I'm, I'm allergic to this idea of building a special API uh, specifically for a special client. No, you should build your API should be easy to consume no matter who the client is or adaptable enough depending on what you send in, for example, as an accept header, so they can make that type of adaptation. Having said that, 
there, if you want to have a, a, an endpoint that is going to provide tremendous flexibility, if you can put that power and into the hands of the consumer directly, then you really have added some, some real value there. And I think GraphQL is a great use case of that, right? So if, if I want to provide the ability for a consuming API, uh, for, for an API consumer to, to grab exactly what they want and exactly the format they want, they can use GraphQL to do that. And that becomes a great application for, for backend as a front end. Just, just one, uh, one example there. Yeah, and Gary, I, I would add on to your, your, your point there, like, to me, REST is, it gives you a great mechanism as an org to manage some of the things you want to achieve through your business architecture. So the yeah. generic service, you you want to create products or services that are generic and not bespoke to a certain customer or certain thing. You define your, your org in a proper business architecture. You've got the right things segmented out. you got the right hierarchy of service. And if you have RESTful services that map to that, you got a great or operating organization. Now, on on the side of that, you're gonna you have some of these niche um, integration capabilities that you mentioned, like GraphQL. You've got um, the gRPC. You've got all these different notions that you can then do other functions that don't fit within that 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 standard general way of working. Um, so I, I I viewed like yeah, I don't think. REST isn't going to go away. It's just, it's just, it's the, it's the basic way to interact. That's the way I put it. Yeah. Agreed. It's a great conversation. Um, we've got, we've got time for one more question um, about upscaling and training. How, how, how did you manage employee training um, or retraining and recruit for new skills? Yeah. What is your point of view on that? Well, we we had at one point. We had uh, uh, don't I don't know the number exact number, but I want to say it was somewhere like twelve thousand people running around building stuff. Um, so not massive in a Google way, but massive in a chaos way for sure. Um, <laughs> and we had, as I mentioned, there were there were many um, divisions of the company that had different levels of maturity. In some areas, they were. They were starting from scratch from a technology perspective, so that was easier because you can, you can. You, it's about hiring and and you know skilling up an org. Um, other parts had had a lot of staff that had had great industry knowledge, uh, great uh, technology background, just wasn't quite up to snuff on the latest of theirs. So you know, getting the right training modules in place, and and we actually had a, a big uh, training push globally. Uh, utilizing, I, I believe we even partnered with Google on that, on on training on uh, microservices and cloud computing and how this all fit together. And you know, and it wasn't just for developers; it was for product people, for the the program uh, people, to the various managers in the organization. So we did a holistic thing um, around that. Now. The program at the API program itself, we created a portal, you know, a, a um, corporate site that's all about the program. So, how do you work with us? How what's the process? How does step one through step twenty, and then also some really basic handbooks like what what is an API, all the way down to you know some of the things we talked about in in this conversation that might be more in the weeds to then the the architectural patterns to all that we so we we have an informational uh site that we use to onboard teams and get them running and we step them through the first number of apis they create and then sort of back away and let them throttle from there so so it's a, it's an ongoing ongoing exercise every every time we meet with those stakeholders we're looking for did where are they and what else can we do for them great gear is, is there anything you want to add on that topic no not really to, for staffing uh, not so much not not really for retraining <laughs> just like skill skill up up, up leveling 
I don't think that I have anything. Well, I mean, there, there's okay. Maybe one thing. Um, something that does often come with this idea of training and up level is also governance. And I, I think sometimes that you'll see the the pendulum go a little too far on the governance side, and that just in, that just hurts innovation. So yeah. you don't want to let that happen. Governance is important. You need it, but it should be it should be enabling for good patterns, and it should be easy to adopt. Um, and and actually, governance can help train a little bit. Like so, you put it's really hard. If, if I hand you a blank piece of paper and I tell you to go do something, and uh, there's no guardrails and no structure whatsoever, it's that can be um, uh, paralyzing uh, to get anything done. But as soon as you provide some guardrails, it gets a lot easier to to, to be creative in that in, within those confines. And I think that's what governance should be. And doing that makes it easy to succeed, and also creates its own self learning environment uh, to, to build on these principles. Yeah, and in gear, I would say governance is kind of like what they say about metrics, right? Track, track what you have to, right? Yeah. Not, not everything. You're like you don't want metrics for everything, because then you you just got cl clutter of stuff that you're trying to report on and gather all the time. You slow things down. But what you want is to understand the key key things that you need to do, and that's where governance comes in. For us, it's all, it's about security, about consistency of of um, of craft and what the output. Um, but then even there, we can start pulling back a little bit, make sure the right people are in, in the org in the different parts that can do that for themselves. And their job becomes how do you, you know, how do you bring that back? But governance is a whole other track that you can talk for five years about. Uh, you know, it's sure. a, it's a, it's an art form for sure. Absolutely. Great. All right, Neil Gear, thank you so much for your time. Uh, for those attending, thank you so much uh, for for taking the time to uh, to uh, listen to us and to share your questions. Uh, we'll be sharing the recap post um, in the forums. Um, we'll try to address as many of the questions we weren't able to touch uh, today. Um, thank you so much for attending. Thank you, everybody. Bye. -bye.